there, and welcome to New Life Church. We're glad you can join us. Before the message begins, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to all our social media platforms so that you can stay informed on all our latest content and events. If you feel led to invest in the ministry, please visit our website, newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again, and God bless. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, guys. I love you guys so much. It's always encouraging every Sunday to see you guys. And I just also, I want to thank you guys so much for how much you guys have just encouraged us and supported us. I know that with Kimmy, we're 10 days away from having this newborn child, our first kid and in our lives, and we're so excited. But it's been such a pleasure and such a delight to see how much you guys have just surrounded us uh, and just give, gave us, like, affections, got the card shower. It, I just... I don't know. It, it makes me feel so encouraged to know, man, this is my first kid, and I get nervous. I'm like, what do I do? But it makes me encouraged to know that when I don't know what to do, I have a family to fall back on. So I thank you guys. But if I'm being honest, I'll say something. Whenever I pray about our, chil- our baby, our baby girl that's coming up, I, I always pray a few things. I pray, God, please grant her good health. Give her good health, Lord. Biological, psychological, emotional, spiritual, give her good health because I want what's best for her. Then I also pray, God, please protect the delivery process because I know that Kimmy's going to need it, but so am I. I get kind of like nervous whenever Kimmy's in pain and I don't know what to do. I'm like, what do I do? And so then I start panicking and I'm like, so I pray, God, please be over the delivery process that everything will be fine with Kimmy, the baby, and me. And then I pray, God, please help us to be great parents. And please do not let her be like how I was when I was a kid. (laughs) Because if I'm being honest, when I was a kid, I was a brat. I was a brat. And um, I was a brat, and I had this way of, like, if I did not get what I wanted, I would throw a temper tantrum. I would let everyone in the room know. Thanks, Mom. Yep. I would let everyone in the room know I did not get what I want. Oh, man, and I feel so bad for the things I put my mom through. She had to endure most of it. My, uh, when my dad, he lives in Texas. He lived in Texas when I was growing up. And my dad had an interesting way of getting me through my temper tantrums. My dad, whenever I would throw a temper tantrum, I would be like, I want this. And he'd be like, no. I would sit there and I would pout and I would make sure everyone knew that I'm upset and my dad is not going to make me happy. So my dad would quote a great philosopher and poet, Mick Jagger, (laughs) and he would say, you can't always get what you want, (laughs) but if you try sometime, you might find you get what you need. And so I would be like, stop it. I would get so pouty, and he would still sing, you can't always get what you want. He would sing that to me, and if I was still pouting, then he would grab me by the face, and he's like, there's a frown on that, and he would smear my face, and he's like, nope, there's still a frown on it, and he'd smear my face until I wouldn't stop laughing, until I'd start laughing. And that's how I was as a kid, and I'm like, God, please don't let her be like that. Don't let her be this brat that feels like she has to get everything that she wants. And this week, as I read through what we're going to be talking about today, the Sermon on the Mount, I realized Jesus has some things to say about when we ask and we don't get what we want. So if you guys want, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew 7. Uh, I'm going to have one of our students, Caitlin, come up and read. As you guys are turning your Bibles, yeah, I always like to create a, a if you guys have the YouVersion Bible app, uh, if you go to the YouVersion Bible app and you open it up. On the bottom right-hand corner of the YouVersion Bible app, there's a tab that says more. If you collect more, select more, uh, you should see about six tabs down. It says events. If you hit events, it might ask you to, to allow your location. You have to select yes so that you can see, and God knows where you're at at all times. And then you'll see New Life Church. And if you click New Life Church, there's some sermon notes right there. So if you want to help, if you like following along that way, Feel free. If not, you can always handwrite. But we're going to look to the to the the Sermon on the Mount today. And Caitlin, if you don't mind, Matthew 
7, verse 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will you give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven be good, give good gifts to those who ask him? Nice. Thanks, Caitlin. As we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, I never noticed this before, uh, but I realize how much every little section is building upon each other. I don't know if you guys have picked up on that or not, but I notice everything builds upon each other. If you guys, this is your first time here, welcome. The Sermon on the Mount that we've been going through, it's, uh, it's always important to remember that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus speaking to large crowds of people, and he is trying to encourage them. This is how to get your heart prepared and in an alignment with the kingdom that is coming and is here. And so we read the Sermon on the Mount, of, and we have to look at our own lives and realize, okay, what do I need to do to align myself with the kingdom and so he gives a number of little, little passages, sections uh, of like teachings. You have heard it said this, but I tell you this. And, and then he gets to Matthew 7 where he's, uh, he's talking about um, a form of prayer. If you guys remember not too long ago, Stephanie preached on prayer. Stephanie preached on uh, the, the section of prayer. And uh, um, when, when Stephanie spoke about the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, uh, we realize that the, the prayer that, um, that Jesus gave us, it, it provides us with content for a personal, purposeful prayer, and uh, it, it gives us the correct posture of how our heart should be whenever we go to prayer. So uh, in, in Matthew 6, that's, that's God tells them, okay, this is how you should pray. But then later in this chapter, we realize Jesus is giving us another form of prayer, and in this passage, how does Jesus define prayer? Ask. That's all he says, just ask. He says that's a form of praying. And it's continuing to establish a form of acceptable prayer. You know, sometimes for me, it's, all, it's uncomfortable to, to, like, ask for help sometimes or say, like, hey, I need something. I, you know, we always want to put our best foot forward or something. But, and especially when it comes to God, I know how messed up I am. So how dare I go to God and ask him for anything when I just messed up or something? And yet Jesus said, that's all right, ask. And so when I thought about uh, the Lord's Prayer and then this little section teaching on prayer, um, there, there was uh, a couple similarities, but when you think about it, what's, uh, what's some similarities that you notice in the, in the Lord's Prayer and this teaching on prayer? There's one, there's one major thing that has not just been in these prayers, but has been carried throughout all the sermon, and that... Jesus is encouraging his followers how they should view God. What's the first line of the Sermon on the Mount? Our Father in heaven. And he continues that with this. Man, if, which of you whose son, if he asks for a fish or if he asks for bread? And if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He's continuing to remind us, this is how you need to view God. So, um, also something that I also found interesting whenever I, I thought about these different prayers is if we continue to think about um, the message that sermon, uh, the sermon that uh, Stephanie preached on prayer, when we begin to pray, uh, we have to remember a couple things. In Matthew 6, when Jesus starts to pray, he's, he, tells, he tells people, don't pray like the pagans. And they just continue to lift up a whole bunch of empty things, hoping that just by saying something, eventually one thing will stick and they'll be heard. But, but it says, and said this in verse 8, it says, Do not be like the pagans, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. So we have to have, we have to, when we come to each section, we have to remember what Jesus already said. Jesus already taught us how to pray through the Lord's Prayer, but he also said, 
don't ramble and say all these things thinking that you can have the right magic words to get what you want, but instead, remember who you're praying to and remember that he needs, knows what you need before you say a single thing. And the same is true whenever we come to this prayer in Matthew 7. When we come to prayer and when we come to praying and asking God for things, we have to remember three foundational truths when we are going to God in prayer. The first is that God invites us to call him Father. He invites us to call him Father because he wants you to know that is how he sees you. How does a father treat his children? A good father. He loves them. He provides for them. He protects them. So Jesus is reminding us, his disciples, remember, it's your father who you're praying to. But he also says something interesting. I always, I always thought it was funny. Why, does he, why do we have to state the location? Our father in heaven. It's not like we're writing a letter. Like we don't have to say our father, who I think right now is in Mississippi or whatever. No. You say our father in heaven. It's important to remember that he's in heaven. Why? Because whenever we remember that he's in heaven, it causes us to remember that he sees all things. He understands all things. He knows all things. And he's in control of all things. So first, we got to remember God is our father. And second, he's in heaven and he knows exactly what we need. And he's in control. That's the third thing. So if he's our father and he's in heaven and he's in control of all things and he knows all things, and the third is that he knows exactly what you need before you ask a single thing of him. But he still invites you to ask. So the first thing, first thing he says is ask and it will be given to you. Ask and it will be given to you. You know, um, when, a, when a child is first learning to speak, what is one of their first forms of communicating? Usually, so um, if, you guys, uh, if, if you guys are not new, you probably remember uh, Joe, had, uh, Mateo, if you guys have seen Mateo run around. He's probably, as I thought about like children, I think he might have been one of, the, one of the like first children that I felt like I really got to watch grow up like to, to where he is. And the, something funny about Mateo is one of the first things he learned how to say was so big because, because Joe would say, hey, how big is Mateo? And J Mateo would say, so big. It was just something kind of like they trained him how to say. So he just knew what to say, when to say it. But the first thing I feel like Joe and Melanie taught Mateo to say on his own was more, more. He had, he did, he had this sign language that they taught him, whenever you want something, say it. The first thing that children usually learn how to communicate is when they want something. You would give Mateo like a banana or whatever he liked and he'd go, more, more, can I have more? And the same thing with children. Man, as, as I think about our baby and I think about how she's going to grow up, I know when I was a kid, usually when I'd wake up in the morning, what's the first thing I would say? Can I have some cereal? <laughs> Can I have some food? You know, you, the first thing that's usually, the first form of communication is usually asking. And the first thing that we think of when we're a kid is usually we just communicate. What do we want? Because that's how we think. So when we think about what a children learns, how a child learns to communicate through asking, we also have to consider what does the parent do? Whenever I woke up in the morning and I would go to my mom and I'd say, Mom, can I have some cereal? What would she say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I love you. Sure. Why would I withhold that from you? No, absolutely. And so whenever we come to God and we ask him something, he wants us to know, I love you, absolutely. I'd love to give you what you need. See, Jesus tells us to view God as our Heavenly Father when we pray because this is how Jesus is de depicting our relationship with God. This is the foundation of how we need to understand prayer. And we have to understand when we pray, we're praying to someone who loves you but is in control of everything and knows everything. And this is a vital way that God shows us that he loves us. When we go to him and we ask he can show you, absolutely, I love you, so let me give you what you need. It's one of the vital and most important things that God shows us in his love. This is why it says, man, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We're evil, and we know how to love our children. How much more is a good and perfect God going to treat us? 
What does our Heavenly Father give us? Good gifts, good things, because he loves us. But if we're honest, after a while, especially as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, just like any good child, we realize that when we ask something, we don't always get what we want. Sometimes when we ask, God does, might say no, or he just doesn't give you in that time. So what do we do when, when, we, uh, when we ask and we don't receive, like, like it says, ask and you'll receive? He says, then seek and you'll find. Seek and you'll find. Uh, did, I, don't, I don't know if you're aware, but there are, there's actually probably more than one, but there's a, a major passage when a huge crowd comes to Jesus And Jesus tells them, no, he doesn't give them what they want. In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, what happens is Jesus has just fed multitudes. Says he looks at the crowd, he has compassion on them, and he feeds them. He gives them, he gives them what they needed. But what happens is Jesus decides he needs to retreat to a place. And night comes, he tells the disciples, hey, go, go, go across the Sea of Galilee. And then he, he does the whole thing where he calms the storm, and it's amazing. And then he gets to the other side, and you find out the disciples, all that, those crowds were looking for him. And it says in John chapter 6, verse 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Well, then they asked him, well, what must, we do, uh, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, so what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread for, from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, You have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son of Man and believes in him shall have eternal life and will raise them up. At the last day. The crowds. Did Jesus give them what they wanted? No. It's kind of a funny play of events. I always kind of chuckle at this story because they, they really think that they can convince God to give them, or Jesus to give them food. They come over after eating their fill and they're like, hey, where'd you go? You got away from us. And Jesus was like, I'm telling you, you're not looking for me because you think you want what I have to offer. You're looking for me because you ate and got full. That made you happy. And you're wanting more. And they said, their response was, well, if you really are who you say you are, then what what sign are you going to give us? Because Moses gave them bread. They gave them manna from heaven. See? So give us some more bread from heaven. And he was like, "Ah, you don't understand. My father gave them bread, but now he wants to give you something better. He wants to give you the bread of life. That's why he says, do not work, he tells them. 
The crowds, he said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. See, Jesus wanted to give them something, but he wanted to give them the right thing. He wanted to make sure that they were getting the right thing. And so when God doesn't give us what we ask for, it's an opportunity for us to seek whether or not it is the right thing. When we ask and we do not receive, it is, forces us to seek and understand that we need to seek the right thing. See, the crowds wanted food, but Jesus wanted to give them life. So if, like any good parent, is God going to give us every single thing that our heart desires no. Is he going to give you something that's not good for you? No. See, seeking, seeking the Father forces us to move from this me, self-centered mentality to a God perspective. When we seek him, we are to seek his perspective and his will. That's what Jesus said. I'm not here to feed you and fill your plates. I'm here to do the will of my Father. So when God doesn't give us what we ask for, we have to fall back on those three foundations I said at the beginning. The, the foundation that God is our Father and he loves us, that God is in heaven who sees all things, understands all things, and controls all things, and he knows exactly what we need. So when he doesn't give us what we ask for, sometimes it forces us to, all right, God, well, what is your will then? So seeking invites us to draw closer to God, our Father, so that we understand him better. When we seek to understand this, when we seek to understand his will better, Jesus says, you'll find him. After we move out of the seeking phase, seeking you'll find, he says one last thing, knock, and the door will be open for you. See, what can we do when God Uh, doesn't give us what we ask for, and we think this seems like this would be the will of God. I don't understand. This seems like a good thing that God would want to give me. See, when God doesn't give us what we ask him for, and it seems like it would be in alignment with God's will, we have two options. And the first option, Jesus uh, specifies a little bit more in another passage. Uh, In Luke, it's it's a a similar passage that... um, the account of Luke writes it a little differently. What happens is Luke, the disciples ask Jesus, and they say, in Luke chapter 11, the disciples ask Jesus, they say, hey, can you teach us how to pray? Can you teach us how to pray? And so that is what provokes um, Jesus to say, pray like this. And then he gives them the Lord's prayer. The disciples say, can you teach us how to pray? Because John's disciples, he taught them how to pray. And Jesus says, okay, pray like this. And he gives them the Lord's Prayer. And then right after the Lord's Prayer, he says this. In verse, chapter 11, verse 5, he says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine is uh, on a journey and has come to me and, has, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose that the one inside inside answers, do not bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. That word shameless audacity, some of your Bibles might say uh, his persistence. So he says, yet because of your persistence or shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you'll find, knock, and there will be open to you. In the Gospel of Luke, he ties in the Lord's Prayer with uh, ask, seek, and knock. But he gives that tiny little parable in between. It says, when a man... He has a friend that comes to him that's on a journey and he has no food for him. He goes to his friend in the middle of the night and he asks his friend, please, he's banging on the door, give me some bread so I can feed my friend because he's been on a journey and he needs food. The guy on the inside will be like, what are you doing? It's late at night. No, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. Go away. 
And Jesus says, not because of their friendship will he get up eventually and give him out of bed. He says, because of his relentless, shameless audacity will he finally give him what he wants. So what can we do when God doesn't answer our prayers and we think that this would be in alignment with God? Jesus says, keep knocking. Be persistent. God knows what you need. Be persistent. Keep praying. See that word? I love that word, shameless audacity, uh, or, or, or persistence, because in the original Greek um, that was written, the word literally means without modesty or respect. So Jesus is say, saying, pray boldly. Pray boldly. Pray, pray relentlessly. Pray without shame or embarrassment. Because if we think about this actual parable, you know, it would be very uncomfortable for any of us to wake up in the middle of the night, midnight, one, two, whatever, and go to our neighbor and knock on their door. Would anyone in here do that? I hope not. Yeah, no. Our kids are funny, and they're like, oh, do it. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't. Yeah, I know. You say you would, but you wouldn't. Because the truth is, man, today we live in a completely different world than from when I, even when I was a kid. When I was a kid, there were barely cell phones. When I was a kid, they just had those, like, flip open phones and all you saw was like the bars that just like told you like how much signal you had. But it, so it was very normal to call someone's home and say, hey, is my friend uh, Bill out there? Can I come over and play? Or it would be just as normal for me to walk over to someone's house and knock on the door. Nowadays, if we get a call from a number that we don't recognize, we're like, oh gosh, no. Nowadays, it's, it's super inconvenient. When someone knocks on our door, I'm like, who the heck thinks they, they can come up to my door and knock on my door? We get, all, we get all suspicious. We, like, peek through the window to see who the heck is. We don't act the same as what we used to. So how much more uncomfortable would it be if you went to someone's house in the middle of the night and knocked on their door for bread? Oh, that would be so embarrassing. That happened to me, like, one time. Uh, in, in Kimmy and I's almost six years of marriage, one time at four in the morning, our neighbor knocked on our door, and I, I was panicked. I was like, oh, what's happening? Is there a fire? And I, and I opened the door, and I found out we, uh, it was, there was this uh, elderly woman next door who had um, uh, Alzheimer's. And, man, it was, that's a different story in itself, but she was trying to let me know that her husband was having a medical issue. But in that moment, I was mad. I was like, who thinks they can answer, knock on my door at four in the morning? Finally, I, you know, I opened it, and I was like, oh, yeah, let me help. <laughs> Felt bad for getting upset, but I was upset. And Jesus says, do that when you pray. Don't have any fear. If, I don't care if it's uncomfortable, it's embarrassing, or you're afraid to get rejected again. Knock. Be persistent. Be shameless. Be without modesty or respect. Pray. God says, who cares if it's awkward? I know some, when I talk to the students and I ask, what's your prayer life like? A lot of them said, you know, I, I don't know. And I would ask them, hey, okay, will you be willing to pray? And they're like, eh, I don't really like play, praying out loud. It's understandable. How many of you, you can honestly say sometimes it's awkward to pray out loud because you don't know what to pray. You don't know how to pray. It feels like you're talking to yourself. Jesus says, pray anyway. I don't care if it's uncomfortable. Do it. So he says, pray. If it's uncomfortable, but also, do you still need something? Keep asking. Your father loves to hear you speak to him, especially when it's something that you want. If, uh, if the worship team wants to come back up. So that's the first thing. What do we do when God answers our prayers? When God doesn't answer our prayers and we think it should be in the, in the alignment with the will of God? Well, we keep praying. He invites us, keep praying. Second option, if we don't get what we ask for, we fall back on the fundam fun fundamental foundational truths that he's your father and he loves you. He knows everything that's going on. He knows all of your circumstances. He's in control of everything, and he knows what you need before you say a word. So if he doesn't give it to you for some reason, he says, trust me. It's an invitation to trust. When we say, God, why didn't you give me what I wanted and what I asked for? 
His response is, will you trust me? That's why in Matthew 7, when we go back to this passage, he says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? He asks, you guys are evil. And if your children will ask you for something, and, he, and, you, and, you, don't, and you know what to give them, how much more will your father give you what you need? God knows what's best for us, and he knows what we need. Because the truth is, sometimes we don't understand what we're praying or what we're asking for. Sometimes we think that we're asking for bread. Sometimes we think that we're asking for fish. And the truth is, we're actually asking for stones and snakes. And God knows. And the beautiful thing about God is that he knows what we need and he loves us and he's willing to protect us from our own prayers sometimes. If I'm being honest, man, I'm still that brat this past week, I saw a lot of suffering going on in the world, and I saw a friend who was going through a hard time. I was like, God, where's your grace in this? Where's your love for him in this? And it just makes me angry. And I start to pout. I start to throw a temper tantrum. And I give God the cold shoulder sometimes. So not only is God good, protecting us from the things that we ask for. He's also good because he'll endure our temper tantrums and our cold shoulders. He'll endure our anger and our frustrations. The other, um, not too long ago in our staff meeting, uh, John Watson had us just like read through his psalm. And I remember one of the psalms, David says, it's like, man, I was a beast to you and yet you still forgave me. You still loved me, and I feel like that frequently. That verse hit me so hard. I'm like, God, how often am I a beast to you? And although I don't throw and pout and do whatever, I still throw temper tantrums. I still get mad, and I still wrestle with God. And yet he loves me, and he's willing to endure my anger and frustration towards them. And he's willing to protect me from the things that I might ask for that are not in his will. See, our Father gives us good gifts. We know that. That's what Jesus says. Our Father gives us good gifts because he's not evil like us. Our Father gives us good gifts because he is good. And that is the foundation that we rely on. God is good. How do we know that God is good? Something I feel like, man, God's just taken me through this journey the past probably four or five years now, where he's revealing something in me that I do not trust him. I don't trust him the way that I should trust him. Because when I don't get what I want, I pout, I get angry, I get frustrated, I stop praying, I give up too quickly. But the truth is that we can only recognize that God is good when we fully know and accept the truth. And the truth is, Everything that God gives us is a gift because we don't deserve any of it. Everything that God gives us is a gift because the truth is we all rebel against God and sin. And that feels uncomfortable to say in a world that says, no, hey, we're all good people. We just make bad decisions. And God says, no, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're not. You're not good. None of you. And the truth is we all deserve death. We all deserve criminal's death because we're all rebellious, we all sin, we all mess up. See, God is the source and giver of life. And when we choose something that's apart from God, our natural consequence is death. If we say, I'm gonna live in a way that's apart from something from God, the source of life, our natural consequence is death. And yet God still says, I'm gonna fix that. And he gives us a gift. He gives us his son. And he says, I will take all of your rebellious 
sinful, beastly attitudes onto myself. And I'll, I'll endure the full wrath of God. And while I'm enduring that, I'll let you have my righteousness. Second Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to become our sin so that we would become the righteousness of God. The truth is, we can only know that God is good when we accept the truth that we don't deserve anything that he's given us. And everything that we have right now is a gift. Man, God knows what we need, and he gives us good gifts. That's why lately I've been trying my best to rely on a passage in Romans. In Romans 31, 34. Uh, sorry, in Romans 8, 31 through, uh, I'll do 32. I'll do 34. I like more of the Bible than less of it. <laughs> Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is then the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ, who died, more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. See, the good news is we don't deserve what we actually get. God gives us good gifts. And the good news is that when we don't get what we want, we can trust God because he loves us and he knows what's best for us. How do we fall back and rely and actually believe, okay, God, I don't know why, but in this moment, it does not feel like you're good. How do I know that you're good? According to Romans 8, we know that God is good and he's giving us what we need because he didn't even spare his own son. And if he didn't spare his own son, how much more Will he give us what we need? How much more will he give us what we need? See, he allowed his own son to suffer in our place and to make us right with him. And if he was willing to give his own son, how much more will he give us the things that are best for us? So Jesus tells us, knock. And if it's not open, trust. Ask him for what you need. Seek his will and knock. Be persistent or trust that he's going to reveal what you need. So this brings us to where do we find ourselves in this passage? Where do we find ourselves? Do you know God as your father who loves you? Is there something that you need from him? Are you uncertain of his will? Or are you struggling to trust him? If you guys want to stand, we're going to go into a time of response. I don't know where you guys see yourself in this passage. Man, I see myself still as that temperamental little kid that I'm praying, God, do not let my daughter be like that. But God, help me to trust you. Help me to trust you and draw near to you, to the throne of grace when I need help in my time of need. And trust what Jesus says. He says, come to me and ask because I'm your father. He says, seek me and find that I will give you life. And knock on the door of awkwardness or frustration or suffering and I will open it to give you what is best. Because if you who are evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We're going to go into a time of response and, and worship. If you need prayer, the, alls are op the altars are open. But let's pray and ask God, please, soften this hardened heart of ours 
circumcise our hearts is what it says in Deuteronomy so that we know how to love you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. Do a work that only you can do in us so that we will trust you and we'll stop being those temperamental children of little faith and we'll love you.